Okay, maybe. So I think we can initiate because it's already one minute to ten. Yeah. So, and um, Guru sir has also joined. So a very warm good morning to all the participants who are there on the platform. Um, many more are supposed to be joining in a minute or two, but we'll be initiating with a formal uh, ceremony of the session. So I hope that everybody is well on their places. So today uh, we are joined by a very renowned professor all the way from Prude University. So Dr. Uh, Krishna namely is uh, over here on the platform and we, he'll be talking, he'll be deliberating on a very important topic about all of us here in India talks of things of, but still we somewhere lack in applying the recent innovative technology, specifically when we talk of protected cultivation. So here we are uh, with uh, an insightful session with the expert to listen to his insight. He'll be talking, he'll be elaborating because he has been working for more than a decade on this topic and experimenting and through his experiment, he'll be initiating, he'll be expressing whatever his experiences are. So I hope that will be enriched by his session. So I welcome you, sir, on the platform. I welcome all the learners also on the platform. So initiating with this session, I first of all take the privilege to invite Dr. S.K. Guru sir on the platform, who is a renowned plant physiologist in our university, G.B. Pant University, as also the nodal officer academics under this uh, World Bank funded project, IDP NAHGP here at Pantnagar. So I invite Guru sir for a brief deliberation on exactly what the project is all about and what the academic activity exactly talks of in terms of enhancing the cognitive skills of the students, of the undergraduate students of the university, specifically belonging to agriculture and allied sciences. So over to Guru sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dipti. Uh, very good morning. Uh, head of the Department uh, of Horticulture, Dr. D.C. Dimri sir, my colleague, Dr. Ranjan Srivastav, uh, other faculty members and students who have joined to listen to Dr. Krishna Namali. Uh, I wish you all a very good morning. And uh, on behalf of all of us, the Govind Ballapant University of Agriculture and Technology and the uh, NAHIP IDP project. NAHIP stands for National Agricultural Higher Education and the IDP stands for Institutional Development Plan. It's a component under NAHIP. So on behalf of all of us, I welcome uh, Dr. Krishna Namali, who has joined us from Purdue University to talk to us on this very uh, <clears throat> interesting topic. And I also thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation to be our guest speaker today. And uh, I thank the efforts of the faculty members of Horticulture Department, especially Dr. Ranjan Swastavji and Dr. Disit Imri, sir, for contacting Dr. Krishna Namali for this session. Uh, for the kind information of Dr. Krishna Namali, this National Higher Agriculture Project that we are having here, it basically aims at development of student and faculty members. And it is through uh, such deliberations, interactive sessions with uh, renowned experts from within the country as well as across the globe from uh, all those high ranking universities. Uh, also through uh, talks uh, which take care of entrepreneurship ability and soft skills by renowned experts in those fields. I mean, not only from the professional subjects, also from these aspects, which takes care of personality development. So we have been conducting all these activities for the last one year. We have completed one year of this project. Uh, the undergraduate students, basically it, it targets undergraduate students. But uh, when we have speakers like you talking on such interesting subjects, uh, our postgraduate students and faculty members also join such sessions because we all benefit from such interactive talks. So this is how we have been running this project. And uh, once again, I thank you very much, sir, for in, um, accepting our invitation to be our speaker today and to enrich us on this particular subject because now we know that agriculture is moving ahead from uh, traditional agriculture through green revolution to smart agriculture. And what we'll be talking about is the GPS-based sensors. So the use of sensors is becoming a very common thing in smart agriculture. So we'll be really enriched by your insights into this topic. Thank you very much. Over to Dipti. 
Well, uh, thank you, sir, for, for briefly putting up exactly the overview of the project. Uh, sir, uh, the project is uh, means the project runs under the principal investigatorship of Dr. S. K. Kashyap, who is also dean agriculture of this university. So he uh, he couldn't make out to bring up to this session because he was uh, preoccupied with some meeting. But he has also sent his regards for you. Now uh, coming to Ranjan, sir. So I invite Ranjan sir on the platform, who is a professor, who is a renowned professor of horticulture here at uh, College of Agriculture in GB Panth University, for giving us an overview of a profile of the speaker, so that the audience can know exactly whom they are listening to. So over to Ranjan sir, please. Thank you, Deepthi. Uh, good morning, everybody who is on the platform uh, for this uh, uh, online talk of Dr. Nimali. I think it's a matter of great proud privilege for me uh, to welcome you all, especially Dr. Krishna Nimali, who has uh, agreed to my request and the request of the university for delivering uh, this informative talk, and Dr. Dembri, Dr. S.K. Guru, and all those horticulturists who are into uh, the development of horticulture in the country and abroad. Uh, I welcome you all, and I think it's a good start of a cordial relationship between G.B. Pant University and Purdue University for uh, some of the professional uh, sharing of the platform for different activities, maybe for exchange programs and other things. So uh, coming straight away to introducing uh, Dr. Krishna Nimali. Uh, Dr. Nimali uh, has been responsible for extension research and teaching activities in the department. He specializes in the area of controlled environment agriculture, which includes <laughs> vegetable and ornamental grown in greenhouses and vertical farms using hydroponic production system, which is again very important in our context as well, because everywhere land is using and we are looking for these uh, special uh, structures or say systems to be developed. And he is into sustainability uh, in controlled environment agriculture and train growers with new technology. He is into teaching also. And before going to US, he did his BS, in agriculture from Acharya N.G. Ranga Agriculture University, Andhra Pradesh, and then his master's and PhD from University of Georgia, Athens, uh, U.S. As the name indicates, Krishna in Indian mythology also, we know that Krishna is very diversified and same is true with Dr. Krishna Nevali as well. He has got the experience <clears throat> of industry as well as the institution. He has been in the industry. He has served for Monsanto and even Ramoji Film City. We all know it's a very famous uh, film city of the country and very uh, wonderful landscaping it has been. And then into university as well. So he is assistant professor of horticulture at Pursu, uh, Purdue University currently. Before that, he was postdoc in University of California, Davis. It's a wonder place for horticultural activities and graduate research assistant of horticulture at University of Georgia. And before that, he was in the industry. Uh, with Monsanto, we all know, uh, for quite uh, some period. And before that, he was in uh, Ramoji Film City. And he has got many awards to his credit, like Technology Award, Above and Beyond right. Award, Military Rearjava, many more. So I just don't want to get into those because we are more into listening to him. Uh, so, And he is member of uh, professional societies like American Society for Horticulture Sciences, and American Society of Plant Biologists. This is in very brief about him, but then when we will be listening to him, we will come to know that yes, how smartphone-based sensors can be useful and that can be implied under our conditions for greenhouse production. So over to Dr. Krishna Nimali and then welcoming you, sir, for this lecture and welcoming all the participants who are uh, the keen listeners here. Dr. Deepthi, please. Yes. That's it, sir. Uh, so uh, now without wasting a minute further even, I invite the guest of the day for his deliberation, please. please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Devti. Um, thank you, Dr. Ranjan Srivastava, uh, Dr. Dimri, and Dr. Guru. And uh, thanks to all those who are joining me today. I see a lot of doctors on the participant list. That tells me that there are a lot of faculty members today. Um, and also there are probably a lot of graduate students and as Dr. 
Guru mentioned there probably are also undergraduate students. So it's a privilege uh, uh, to, to speak to uh, you know, professionals and graduate students from the, the elite agriculture university from India. So it's uh, I, I take it like a privilege to myself. And uh, I'm very fortunate to be one of those who is invited to, uh, to come and uh, talk about uh, uh, modern technology to, to your university. So I really appreciate that and I thank you for welcoming me. Um, uh, what I want to do today is um, I'm going to um, share my desktop um, pretty soon here and uh, show the presentation. But I see a lot of uh, people uh, turned off your cameras. Um, this is a strange world. We're all trying to get adjusted to this online virtual reality. Uh, but just to make it a little, little bit more live, if you are fine, please turn on your cameras. So it'll be more like a, a, a lively conversation for me. I can I can put uh, your name to the face so that way I know whom I'm talking to. But it's totally up to you. If you don't feel comfortable, don't worry about it. But if you're asking a question, uh, please do try to um, you know turn on your camera so I can see whom I'm talking to. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, especially to graduate students and undergraduate students, is my uh, my style of presentation, my style of teaching is very, very informal. Um, I like to keep it quite interactive. Um, I, I go slow sometimes. I explain a lot. Most of my presentation slides, you will notice they are very simple, a lot of pictures, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, less data, less uh, complicated stuff. So it should be easy for you to follow. But in the event, in the event, if there is any concern, uh, question, or, you, or if, if my talk is going too fast, um, do not hesitate. Uh, it's all OK. We are a big family here. So raise your hand, uh, interrupt me. We can discuss a little bit more, and I will make sure that it is very well understood, and then we can move on to the next slides. Um, I have a lot of information. We'll see how it goes, but let me start by sharing my desktop. Um, Ms. Deepthi, please confirm um that uh, um you can uh, you can start seeing my desktop uh, when it shows up hopefully now oh uh, yes, yes it's visible yes. sir yes you can see my desktop okay so what it means is at this point of time um i have projected it onto a a sort of like a a, a presentation mode which means i don't see any of the uh any of your uh, images. So if you have a question, you have to ask me. Uh, just turn on your mic. Uh, just uh, interrupt me, which is totally fine. OK. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, is this something clearer? Uh, can you please confirm, Ms. Deepthi, if this, this uh, magnification is fine, I will stay with this. What do you, uh, what do you yes, think? Yes, this is fine, sir. This is, is this fine. fine? If you don't okay. want to switch to the slideshow mode, this is fine, sir. This is fine with you. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, all right. So, so uh, the the title of my talk is "Smartphone Based uh, Sensors for Greenhouse Production," and we'll get into that details. Um, here is some of my information about me. Uh, Dr. Ranjan Srivastava mentioned a lot about me already. Uh, my telephone number and my email address are shown here. Uh, Purdue University. Um, I am going to add a little bit more information about myself, um, especially my journey. Uh, a lot of that is already covered, but I'll just add a few more details. So I'm born and raised um, in southern India uh, from state of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, at the time it was not uh, separated from Telangana. And so uh, I was born in uh, the, the holy temple town of Tirupati. Uh, probably many of you know this place. Uh, it's famous temple there. And my mom and my dad uh, were faculty in the local universities there. Uh, I did my bachelor's in agriculture from uh, APAU, and then it became Acharya Engineering Agriculture University. Um, and then I uh, moved to uh, basically between between finishing up my bachelor's in agriculture and taking up a job, I actually spent uh, five years uh, as a farmer, basically did pure agriculture. 
um, learned everything about farming, not just uh, uh, theoretical aspects from my uh, college education, but also had some practical experience. I was not a good farmer. I burnt my fingers. I didn't make any money. And so I decided to uh, find a job. And so I went to Hyderabad and uh, started working as a horticulturist at Ramoji Film City. At the time, the Film City was just at its inception. There were not many tourists. We were all mainly, uh, there was a bunch of six or seven horticulturists, and our goal was to create those gardens. And my job was to maintain a nursery propagation, develop propagation material for the landscaping. Um, I had a greenhouse and a nursery that, that I was managing uh, at the time. Spent about uh, four and a half years and then I decided to uh, move to United States. Um, and in 2001, January 1st, I, I landed in the United States. So it's almost 20 years now uh, since I'm here. And so I'm a naturalized citizen of United States now. Um, for a very long time, I wanted to remain as an Indian citizen. However, unfortunately, Indian government doesn't allow a dual citizenship. So I had to change my citizenships to United States citizenship. But then I, I came to United States 2001, did my master's and PhD at University of Georgia in floriculture physiology, um, mainly looking at uh, photosynthesis biology and water plant water relations related to greenhouse grown crops. Um, after my PhD, I went to UC Davis, uh, which is, if you can see my mouse right here is UGA, from one end to all the way to the other end of the country, almost 3,000 miles. Um, California is a beautiful place. So I did a couple of years of postdoctoral fellowship at UC Davis. And at the time, Monsanto company was looking for scientists. So they hired me. And so I came to Midwest. So this is the middle part of the country. So I came to St. Louis. Uh, it's in uh, Missouri where Monsanto's headquarters is there. I worked in Monsanto for 10 years. Monsanto moved me between uh, Illinois, Missouri, and to Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Um, this is where I picked up uh, some of the fundamentals of uh, plant phenotyping or precision agriculture or image-based sensors. Uh, Monsanto used to have a very large automated greenhouse, and I was I was there uh, working there for almost four years. But then I came back to Mon again to St. Louis. Uh, worked in Monsanto Regulatory Division and at the point of time I was interacting with a lot of people around the world trying to describe about the benefits and the safety of genetically modified crops. But I was mainly their controlled environment plant physiologist at the time. Ten years after Monsanto, one fine day I decided that I should go back to my original interest of you know, being honest, try to talk uh, openly do research that I really like, and that's the place for a university. And also teach. The noble uh, uh, thing is to teach, and that's what I, my dad used to tell me. So I moved to Purdue University in 2016, and uh, uh, I've been there, uh, Purdue, for almost uh, four and a half years now. Um, like Dr. Srivastava mentioned, I'm a, uh, my designation is controlled environment agriculturist. So I do extension, research, and teaching. My teaching component is small. I just teach one semester, but I have a large extension and a large um, research uh, appointments. Excuse me. Um, I was I was kind. Of, I connected my telephone um, to. Um, apologies for that. I was intending to show something on my smartphone, but I think that sh that should take care of it. Um, do you still hear me? Just want to confirm that you're 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 still hearing me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Thank you. So, so I've been here, here at Purdue uh, for uh, four and a half years, and my research is involves greenhouse hydroponics, uh, indoor plant factories where we are trying to uh, develop uh, leafy greens with increased nutrients uh, like vitamin A, vitamin K levels, and we're also trying to produce uh, uh, leafy greens that are free of uh, bacterial pathogens like E. coli, salmonella, etc. I'm also playing with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, light spectra with LED lights to 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 create an optimum environment. Um, but then the area I'm going to talk about is uh, about uh, floriculture, which is also one of the areas I, I do research. 
and uh, it's all about uh, the most modern uh, ways of uh, monitoring plants. Um, but then what I want to do is um, there are five topics and we'll see how far we can go through these. Um, I want to start with a little bit about Purdue University because I know that a lot of students um, and Purdue University is one of those areas. If you are interested in the future to come to the United States, this is one of the top universities, um, both for agriculture and also technology. And so it, it, it matches very well with what you're doing. So I want to give a little bit introduction about Purdue University. Then I'll talk about uh, general situation about floriculture industry in the United States. Um, then we dive into the main topic of monitoring in greenhouses. Why should we monitor? What are the challenges? And then I will, uh, at the point of time, I'll do a small one minute demonstration about uh, what, what the smartphone sensing is using my, my, my smartphone. And I will show you a bunch of applications afterwards. And up to this item number four, things should move very smooth and easy. Now, depending on amount of time we have and also the amount of interest, uh, we can um, go or dive into this last aspect. This is the, the the little bit tougher aspect where I can describe about the technical aspects about how this is all done, what is the logic and what type of programming is done, things like that. But then we'll see if, if there is an interest, we'll go there. If not, we'll at least try to cover these first four topics. OK, sir, sir, your screen is not visible. Oh, it's my screen is not visible. Let's see uh, what uh, has happened. No, Mr. Rajiv, it's visible from our side. Yeah, it is visible. It is visible. Uh, so if there's an issue from your side, uh, you please log in again uh, because there might be sure. some interruptions in your uh, software. So please log out okay. and log in again. You'll be able to see the screen. Okay. Can, uh, can, uh, can a few more people confirm me that uh, you're all seeing my screen and uh, there aren't many issues here? Yes, sir, we are seeing your screen. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, and, and and thank you for uh, letting me know. If you have an issue, please uh, do not do not hesitate. Uh, let us know and we'll try to figure out. And if if you're not seeing my screen, um, yeah, please, uh, please let me know. All right. Uh, let, let's talk about Purdue University. Um, and maybe maybe I will try to get to the slideshow because there are some of the pictures that that might look better. Um, so here, here is Purdue University, United States, map of United States. Um, this is West California. Um, and then this is called Midwest. This is like uh, Punjab, um, where most of the food is grown. It's just like the, the bread bowl of the United States. The states like Illinois, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Indiana, Pennsylvania. These are the areas where a lot of food crops are grown. Indiana is right in the heart of the uh, of that uh, uh, bread ball, what we call Midwest and Purdue University is is right there. And then I'm going to show you one more picture here, a little bit uh, um, expanded here. So this is the state of Indiana, so it matches very well with India. So Indiana, that's the state where I am. And Purdue University is uh, in uh, a town University town like Panthnagar is a university town. Purdue University is in West Lafayette. West Lafayette is a university town. Now I'll, I'll show pictures of that in a minute here. So this is where the Purdue University is there. But then, but then um, um, Purdue University is uh, about two and a half hours from Chicago. So if if I have to fly from India from New Delhi to Chicago, straight flight about approximately 14 hours uh, from there you can drive within two and a half hours you can get to Purdue University. The capital of Indiana is Indianapolis which is the big city and uh, that's about an hour for us from Purdue University. A lot of Indian population in Indianapolis. Um, zooming in further um, if you look at uh, the the West Lafayette here is the town of West Lafayette and here is Purdue University the yellow box is Purdue University and we'll get to that in a minute. But what I want to mention is um, usually originally it used to be town of Lafayette. Um, and then there is this huge big river. It's called Wabash River and uh, Purdue University is one of the land grant universities 
And there was a land that was donated in um, 1869, 1868-69 to construct Purdue University. And so everything on the west side of Lafayette became West Lafayette. And this town is pretty much university. And then those people who work at a university bought homes and they live all around the West Lafayette area. Purdue University is one of the only few universities which has got its own airport. And so people can fly from Chicago and other parts of the country straight into the university. Size wise, it's about 2,500 acres. Um, and I got, uh, believe, one more picture. So here is the university. Basically, this is uh, different buildings within the, within the Purdue University. There are about 13 colleges, uh, Purdue University. Uh, of the 13, College of Agriculture, College of Engineering, and Granite School of Management are real big names. Um, and a lot of students actually go to these uh, these colleges. But there are also college, these colleges like College of Education, Health and Human Sciences, College of Liberal Arts, College of Pharmacy. There's Purdue Polytechnic, and there's College of Veterinary Medicine and, and other colleges. So there are about 13 colleges. But I belong to College of Agriculture. And uh, there are many, many faculty from India, uh, top engineers, they, they, they work in College of Engineering. A um, few more inf details about Purdue University. It's uh, rated number five most innovative schools in the United States. It's funded, founded in 1869. Um, we uh, get about more than in, in 2019, 2020, the total research dollars, money that we got from outside funding, sponsored funding is close to $500 million. That's a big lot, big money. What it tells us, most of the researchers are very active and they're all about receiving this type of monies from outside. And so that money is invested in Purdue to do research, train students, buy new equipment, build more new facilities, things like that. There are approximately 46,000 students um, that includes both um, graduates and undergraduate students. There are about 10,000 graduate students and nearly 36,000 undergraduate students at Purdue. Um, there are about 1,900 tenured, tenured track faculty members. College of Agriculture within Purdue ranks number 20 globally, and it ranks number seven within the United States, and there are about 3,400 students with 680 graduate students. Just uh, found some uh, interesting names, um, but then uh, Neil Armstrong, which probably all of us know, is the first man to step on moon. He actually graduated from Purdue University. And I will say this, Purdue University has produced most number of astronauts who work at NASA. That's because of uh, the, the involvement in that engineering program. Here is uh, uh, the statue of Neil Armstrong, and I don't know whether you can read this, but this is a Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering. So he is, is, there's a hall named after him. Orwell Rittenbacher is a big entrepreneur. He produces popcorn, and he's also a graduate of Purdue University. Now, uh, I do not know um, if you know this person, but I just found recently, he's an Indian actor, Dalkir Salman, and I think he is the one who acted in the movie Karwan uh, recently, son of, I think, uh, uh, a, a South Indian actor, Mamuti, I believe. I learned recently that he actually graduated from Purdue University. Uh, he did his uh, business management as an undergrad at Purdue oh. University. So, a lot of stuff going on at Purdue yes. University. I see. Webinar. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, can you please mute on your end? I appreciate huh? that. Can you please mute? Yes, yes. Thank you. Let's move on. Next slide. Um, what about students? And this is uh, this is all the students who came to Purdue from different countries. So all over the world, many, many, many parts of the world, students come to Purdue University. And if you look at all of them, most of them come from India and China. So this is the total number of students who came from India since 2008, so the last 10 years, 10, 10 to 11 years, nearly 50,000 students came to Purdue University. Um, so uh, it's it's uh, it's pretty pretty open to Indian students. And, and because of that, there are huge 
activities related to India that happen at Purdue. That almost always, you know, every other week there is a program related to India. You can see, you know, Diwali celebrations, Holi celebrations, some nice talks about India. So I never feel like I'm away from from India. If, you know, if I involve myself with the, with a lot of activities going on. Um, what's life at Purdue? Well, um, you know, um, I just want to point to one thing. If you notice this down here, right corner, you see this robot. It's a it's an autonomous vehicle. It moves on on its own. It moves everywhere in the campus, and there are dozens of such vehicles. You know what they are? They are delivering pizza to students. So Purdue is technologically so advanced that we have developed robots. Students can order pizza, and these robots deliver pizza to their hostel rooms. Uh, some other pictures of Purdue University. This is the central area where the, the president's office is there. Um, it's the central fountain. Purdue uh, women's uh, basketball team is very famous. This is Purdue Memorial Hall. And inside, students have a lot of uh, restaurants inside this. This is built in memory of all those uh, soldiers who died uh, uh, in protecting country. Uh, this house uh, in general, Purdue is quite busy during uh, regular uh, days. And if you have noticed this, the steam engine, Purdue, uh, Purdue uh, is called, the students are called boiler makers. And, and, and I don't want to go into the reasons why they are, but then uh, you will see when you're walking in Purdue, these, these uh, steam engine like locomotives, people sit in there and they go and tour the Purdue University. So it's a very lively university you know, to, to begin with. Okay. Uh, talking about College of Agriculture, there are several departments in the college, agriculture, biological engineering, ag economy, economics, agronomy, animal sciences, biochemistry, go down the list, horticulture, landscape, architecture is right there, food science, um, so this whole block is College of Agriculture and these buildings are individual departments and right here and I've, I've circled, uh, uh, sorry, I put a, a yellow box here. That's the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture with a beautiful garden next to it and a lot of greenhouses uh, where most of the faculty do their research. Uh, here is a picture of the Horticulture Department and this is uh, attached uh, nice landscaping surrounding the department. There are about 32 faculty members. Uh, actually, there are uh, out of the 32, there are uh, four faculty members who are from India, including myself. There are about 48 service professional, administrative, and technical staff in the department. 18 graduate students and 10 postdoctoral fellows. But four of them are actually from India, or four or five of them. We have about 145 undergraduate students with uh, whose main focus is in horticulture. A variety of research is done in the department, starting from turf, viticulture, molecular genetics, pomology, breeding, controlled environment ag, including myself, specialty crops, marketing, vegetable production, you name it, plant nutrition, functional genomics, biochemistry, everything related to horticultural crops um, is done in the department. All right, that's a, a kind of like a, some introduction about the university, so I thought it might be useful to some of the students if you're interested. And so I'm going to move on to this uh, floriculture situation in the United States. OK, just to set the stage why this monitoring is important. OK. All right, so what floriculture crops are popular in the United States? Now in India, cut flowers are probably the most popular uh, crops with floriculture, like roses, garbers, um, lilies, chrysanthemums. But uh, in the United States, the top selling floriculture product are bedding plants. So these are annuals and they grow uh, during mostly during summer and spring seasons and little into fall. But they are grown either in directly in the ground or they're grown in containers. So here is an example of bedding plants. This is petunias and these petunias bloom vigorously during spring and summer months. Those are the most popular floriculture crops in the United States. We also have a lot of cut flowers, um, but most of our cut flowers are imported from Mexico. Um, before 1980s, there was a lot of rose cut for production in the United States, but uh, labor costs are quite high and, and it's quite cheaper in Mexico, south of the border. And on top of that, many countries in Mexico are pretty close to equator. And so they get beautiful sunlight like Colombia, for example, 
and and their labor is cheap and light levels are so high so they produce really high quality cut flowers and so we decide simply to import and that's probably the best way uh, potted plants are also very popular here is uh, poinsettias with those beautiful red bracts and these are very popular during christmas time these are given as gifts chrysanthemums is also potted plant easter lilies are potted plants and those Easter lilies become very popular during Easter time, which is Good Friday uh, in, in India. So, so those are all potted plants and they're mainly meant for holidays. Uh, perennials are very popular. These are hydrangeas, very popular perennials. We have a lot of tropicals, foliage plants like Diphenbacchias, Aglonemus, ferns, monsters, philodendrons, things like that. Um, but then more recently, succulents are becoming quite popular and especially with the millennials the angsters and the z generation these are very hardy they don't need to be taken care of like others you just grow them on your windows and add a little water once a week and they remain colorful that's why they get a lot of attraction from angsters so they're becoming very popular the state of florida produces large numbers of millions and millions of these succulents basically cacti right uh, where do we produce uh, floriculture crops mostly in protected agriculture in greenhouses some of our larger greenhouses the largest greenhouse in the united states is approximately 110 acres under green, under the roof basically that's 110 acres is covered by a greenhouse but usually the sizes are in the range of four to five acres and there are also small scale 3000 uh, 300 meter square greenhouse. Pardon me, I, I, I talk in terms of, uh, um, you know, not uh, meter square, things like that. I talk in terms of square feet, pounds. That's because of the way we express units in the United States, but I'll make sure I'll convert to meter square or kilograms whenever I speak. Um, but uh, we also have uh, semi-protected conditions like high tunnels. They don't have any fan and pad cooling, just protection from rain and wind and we grow a lot of cut flowers in the ground um, in, in semi-protected conditions and also a little bit in field conditions. Crops are grown in all three uh, areas. And where are crops mostly sold? And this is, this is the key difference. Most of the crops are sold in supermarkets uh, like Walmart, Home Depot or Lowe's. Growers bring and, and, and leave the material there. And this is a big shift in the last 10, 15 years. Good old nurseries and, uh, and ornamental um, greenhouses, they used to have their own shops, but they are declining. The mass merchandising places like this, supermarkets becoming very popular simply because customers want to simply buy plants when they come to buy food and it's convenience. Everything is available in one location. And so they buy some groceries, fruits and vegetables, and then they walk into garden center, pick up a few plants, and, and that's the major way of sales. And that's why most of the uh, floriculture crops are sold in uh, supermarkets. But <clears throat> what's happening with industry? So if you look at this, this, this is one of the data slides I have. Um, if you look at this, um, I want you to focus on this particular small pie here. This just 7.1% is the net income of, of you know, let's say, uh, a, 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 a flower grower invest hundred thousand dollars. He is going to only get approximately seven thousand dollars as profit, and and that's that's not good. Uh, that's mainly uh, most of the most of the things going away um, um, for labor costs, overhead costs, and dirt costs. Because of that, the, there is a decline in the industry. If you look at the numbers. In the United States between 2012 and 2017. In 2012, there were approximately 27,000 greenhouses, greenhouse businesses. The kind of declined to 25,500 in within a span of five years. It's a drop of 5.5%. So the industry is going down. The floriculture industry is going down in the United States, mainly because there's only 7% of profits. Um, in the in the in the in the in this business um, and and there is that means there's a huge importance to increase the profit margins otherwise this industry is going to wipe away in maybe 20 30 years um, 
in order to make this sustainable, we have to increase profits. And that's the point I want to make um, on based on this data. And so that's where this monitoring becomes so important. The reason is, greenhouse business, as many of you probably know, is a high intense production. What it means is you have a lot of plants in spaced so closely and each plant is important. You add a lot of inputs, um, it, especially in, in the United States. We add uh, lighting, we maintain temperature, CO2 fertilization is done, nutrients are added, labor is expensive. So it's a, it's a high intense production environment where you have to invest to produce a quality crop. And if you're not careful about whether you're supplying your inputs at optimum rate or not, then you will, you will do wastage. Um, you may not be either supplying at the optimum rate, you may be providing more than what plants need, or you may be providing less than what plants need. Either scenario is not good. And so what happens is under these conditions, you lose crop growth, you lose productivity or production efficiency, quality goes down, sale value goes down, crop value goes down. End of the day, you won't get a lot of money. When you start saving on these inputs, you also reduce your operational costs, which will increase your profit margins. So saving on inputs, producing best quality plants, producing more per unit area, these are the ways profits can be increased. And in order to do all of that, you have to monitor. You have to monitor your plants. Are these plants growing very well under optimum levels? Are we supplying light, nutrition, nutrients, temperature, CO2, all of them at optimum level? Are we making sure that we are not over fertilizing? Are we making sure that we are not using money, spending money on these inputs such that they are actually not required? These are the kind of things, and that is the reason one should be monitoring plants. Okay. But then it is not easy to monitor. And for the simple reason, it's high intense. And look at this picture here. This is a greenhouse which produces seedlings, small seedlings, millions and millions of them. The greenhouse is packed with seedlings. How do you know that a small section somewhere in the middle is not doing well? There isn't enough fertilizer there. Nitrogen levels are less. How do you know that? It's not easy. You know, you cannot take a sensor and insert into a pot. If you can do that here and there, but if you have a four or five acre greenhouse and every square meter of that is filled with plants, it is not possible. I mean, same case with pine setias or, you know, these are chrysanthemum plants. And on an average, a greenhouse grower may have up to 200,000, which means two lakhs to three lakhs of containers. And how many can a grower measure? They can measure everything, but it's going to cost them. Labor costs are going to go up. And so it is not easy to monitor. The answer is with technology. We have to rely on technology. Technology has played a pivotal role in floriculture business. I mean, look at these transplanters. They have increased the speed of transplanting from a few dozen per hour or for, for, for 10 minutes to almost hundreds per every 10 minutes. You know, boom irrigation systems, automated system, automated fertigation systems. Look at these robots. These robots actually move parts and they place them in a line. Um, here is LED lighting to increase crop. The technology has been pivotal in floriculture business. And therefore, we have to take the same path, technology path, to even monitor plants. And uh, before I dive into that monitoring techniques, let's look at the evolution of monitoring techniques. Many, many, many decades back, when the technology was not that high, most of our flower growers used to rely on just simple visual methods, meaning you're walking in your greenhouse and you see a plant that's kind of yellow in color, then you know that there is some nitrogen deficiency. Visual, meaning you see by your eye and you make a decision. 
The problem with that is by the time you see a problem, it's already too late. Right. And then there is this laboratory techniques came up. You can take a leaf sample at a plant sample. You can send it to a commercial laboratory. They will take a week of time. They will charge you some money and then they will send some information back to you. But it's expensive. It's also slow. Because of that, we moved from there to some sensors, handheld sensors, EC meters, light sensors, temperature sensors. They're all nice but they only can measure maybe a few parts or maybe a small area. From there, now we are with the fourth generation of sensing, what we call remote sensing. That's the most recent advancement in sensing. Remote sensing basically means you take images, pictures of plants, and you take the pictures and you analyze the pictures, you develop some useful information and I'm going to show you all types of that information shortly, but then you can develop that information from images. The advantage is that, for example, look at this picture. This is precision agriculture, and here there is a satellite up there, 200 miles above our planet Earth, and it can take a picture of almost 200 to 300 acres at a time. And from that picture, it can process, the images can be taken and processed. And that information can be sent straight to a farmer. The farmer has an iPad inside this uh, uh, vehicle and he can see as he's driving using his GPS station, he can see which part of the his land has high fertility versus low fertility. Uh, where should he put expensive seed versus, you know, less expensive seed? Uh, where should he increase spacing? Where should he decrease spacing? These are the kind of things that are possible because of this. So it's, it's just a picture taken by satellite, processed, useful information is generated, and that information is sent to a, a farmer. Something like that can be done in greenhouses, right? You're all probably very familiar with drones. And I can see nowadays drone technology is growing rapidly in India as well. In, in fact, my own hometown, people are using drones for entertainment purposes. They are trying to take videos of the city, right? So maybe we can use a drone. We can connect a camera to the drone and run the drone inside a greenhouse. But it is not that easy. You know, that camera is very expensive. And look at this greenhouse. What happens if this drone hits one of these structural poles? It's going to fall down. It's going to break the camera. So it's not, it's not, there are logistical issues. I will say that drone technology is very popular and I don't mean to, to disregard it, but it is not there yet. It's, it's not there yet because there are so many obstructions, structural things inside a greenhouse and flying a drone can be quite challenging. OK, that brings us to the main topic of smart sensors, smart sensing. Now, these smart sensors, they use smartphones. Um, they use inexpensive cameras. You can put these cameras anywhere you want and uh, control all of them using your phone. Or you can just use your own phone camera. You don't need to even uh, uh, install uh, uh, small cameras. But if you have a large greenhouse or a large facility, you can install inexpensive, cheap cameras, many, many locations, and a smartphone can control all of them, collect pictures from all of them. But if you have a small greenhouse, a 300 meter square greenhouse, you are a small grower, you can just use your own phone camera. And the advantage of that phone is nowadays everybody has a phone. In fact, India is one of the countries where smartphones are growing number wise, extremely, you know, exponentially, exponentially increasing day by day. And why not build a technology then on these smartphones? The advantage of that is A, it is low cost. It is available with everybody. But then if you build a technology on smartphones, you can adopt, you can make it adoptable. Everybody would like to love to adopt it because it's, it doesn't cost anything and can become quite attractive. All right, so what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, take a, a minute off of my present talk here. 
um, up to this point. Are there any questions? Are there any doubts before we dive into section number four? I'm going to stop there. Uh, you're free to ask me any questions. I'm going to minimize and I'm going to go back to my uh, main window here. Um, if there are questions, if there are doubts, if there are anything, we got about a minute or two. So please feel free to ask me, especially graduate students and undergraduate students. Is, this is your time to ask me a question. Do not hesitate. Uh, feel free. Am I speaking too fast? Is my um, uh, description not easy to follow? Anything is a fair game. Just let me know so I can adjust and I can explain to you better. Is everything going fine? It's, uh, I, don't hear from, I don't hear from anyone. OK, go ahead. Thank you. Is everybody comfortable with the way things are going? Is it too much information or is it too little information? Is it interesting or is it not interesting? Anything is fine. Just share a few things. Um, what do you think about it? Yeah, I think it's a very useful application. Thank you. Can can one of the graduate students raise your hand and uh, let me know how things are? How do you how do you how you or he or she thinks about? Um, the topic is it interesting? Is there anything I, I should make a change in my presentation? Students, please. Uh, this is an interactive session. You switch on your videos and talk to Dr. Nimali. Uh, good morning, sir. Hello, Miss Jyoti. How are you? I'm very fine, sir. Uh, sir, yes, sir. Your information is quite. Uh, it is beneficial. So, uh, uh, sir, kindly please uh, throw some more light upon these uh, smart sensing. Yep, we are going to look into that section in the next five ten minutes. Um, yes. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, it's good to hear that uh, uh, it, it is it is what you have expected, and so that's that's good to know. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Anyone else want to chime in? Anyone else want to chime in and comment? Do you have any questions about Purdue University? Um, this is a good time to ask me. <laughs> yes. Uh, students, you can see a lot of, I mean, no, the way Dr. Nimali has shown us the Purdue University, its location in the US. I think even I, I felt like doing a degree program there if I am allowed to do there. <laughs> so for graduate students, uh, you must have those dreams. No, once you complete your graduation, you should be dreaming of doing your master's and PhD in US. And once you have a person there like Dr. Krishna Nimali, you can ask so many things. Uh, MOU with the university uh, for exchange program for the students or for the uh, faculty. Uh, can you please repeat Dr. Srivastava? I didn't catch that. Uh, means uh, I just wanted to know means uh, can we have some sort of MOU uh, with your university? Absolutely, absolutely. We can discuss about that um, and 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 uh, I can work and, and we have uh, special pro, uh, departments who take care of that. Uh, they work with uh, faculty. They work with researchers all over the country who can have a a non-disclosure agreement or a memorandum of understanding between the universities and we can share information, technology, research. Students can come go back and forth. It can be part of everything. Um, so it is an opportunity. Again, keep in mind, I was a student like you all. OK, it's many, many years back. I was a graduate student uh, and I had a dream to come to this country. And you, you, when I came to the United States, I was married. I was 30 years old. I had a kid of four years, but still I felt like coming here and getting educated. My wife came with me and she wants to get educated herself. And so it, it, this is a country still of, uh, uh, you know, opportunities. If you are a hardworking person, there is a great um, future here. That is something I will, uh, will say. Things have changed a little bit, but still this is a great country. Education, for example, is, is one that you should all experience. 
I have seen a huge difference. I have learned a lot. I still learn today, even today. I listen to others, I hear from them. And whenever I talk with somebody, I learn one or two things every day. But if you have that open nature and a hardworking student, this is the country to come to, okay? Well, we'll move on because there is some interesting stuff that I want to share from here, okay? So what I want to do um, is um, I want to share my, um, my phone. So, Ms. Deepthi, can you please tell me if you see my, um, my phone, actually? Yes, I'm sir. trying to share my phone. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, sh yeah, I'm sharing it. Uh, let's see if this shows up. Um, let's see. Yeah, it is, it, it is showing something upcoming alarm. It, it is showing. I see, I see. Okay, let's, uh, let's change this quickly. Um, now you should start seeing it in a minute here. Now yes, do you see yes, my phone? Yes. Okay, so that's the that's that's today. So what I'm going to sh show you is how easy it is to actually um, send something with a smartphone. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to trying to do. Uh, give me one second here. I am going to also see on my end. Okay, here we go. And so now you're seeing some apps, right? Please confirm. Do you see apps? Yes. Sir. Okay. So yes, what happens sir. is, so so I want you to focus on this app. This is called MATLAB. Do you see that MATLAB app? Yes, so that sir. is the software yes, I use. So all my programming is done on MATLAB software, and it's like a a cloud. Okay, an online drive. So I write a program, and I put my programs on this MATLAB drive. And then once the program is there, you know, I just need to open the drive. And so um, it's going to reconnect to that session. Um, and I just put this afternoon a program there to just show you. And it was working fine. So please believe me and hopefully it will work fine now. OK, so now you see um, it's connected uh, to the drive. OK, and I got some codes here. OK, do you see the codes? There's a code called canopy area. Do you see that? Yes. OK, yes, I'm going to try and open that. OK, and then. Um, I'm going to I'm going to show you how easy it is to take a picture. So what I got with me is a so let me turn on the camera. So now the software is controlling my camera, my phone's camera. You see my phone's camera. Now this uh, this is. Uh, this I, 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 I was thinking of bringing a whole pot, but unfortunately I couldn't get to my greenhouse today, but I got a leaf here. OK, can you identify what this leaf is? Anybody? Graduate students, what this leaf? This is curry leaf that I grow in my house. OK, um, you oh. know, curry leaf. <laughs> we add curry leaf and I grow it in my house in pots. Uh, it's, it's outside. It's like uh, minus 12 degrees Celsius today. So I brought all these pots into my house. But what I'm going to show you is I'm going to. So right now the camera is uh, I turn on the software and the software is uh, seeing the, the plant. So OK, and so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to take a quick picture. Um, it's just a click and it's going to evaluate. And shortly it will throw the analysis. Now if you see here. Now look at this picture now. This was the original leaf, right? I just showed you. And then the software captured that image, processed the image. It identified what is leaf and what is background. OK, and it now knows this green part. Now we know what is leaf because we know the leaves with their green in color, but the software doesn't know what is a leaf and what is not a leaf. And so but but now it has identified the leaf and then I asked the software to just measure the area of that plant. Uh, that leaf and it's giving me area something like 17.6 centimeters square. Just like that in a, in a second. So that's how easy it is. I just want to give you uh, a, 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 a demonstration of how easy it is with these smartphones, but I'm going to show you much more applications. OK, so I'm going to turn off this and go back to my presentation. All right. Now I'm opening up my presentation. Um, do you see my presentation now? Yes. Sir. Yes. OK, it is now let's go back and let's start seeing what are the things that can be done. 
So I'm going to show several examples, but all these things can be done, can be measured with a smartphone. You can measure area, height, weight of the plants, number of leaves, number of flowers, seedling number. In terms of color, you can measure the intensity of flowers, progression of flower color, shelf life. You can measure nutrient deficiencies, insect damage. You can also measure certain things about the plant biochemistry, chlorophyll content, nitrogen concentration. You can also measure stress. All these things are possible, okay? Oh, by the way, this is a strawberry plant and, and I just took a picture and it kind of processed that image. Okay, so let's, let's see some examples now, okay? Applications of smart sensors. So here is the first application, germination percentage. So here is a tray of seedlings. These are marigold seedlings. These are germinated and I just took a picture of that and the, the software separates the plant from the background. It removes the soil, the tray, the plastic, the black color and everything. It just retained the plants and then it counted the number of plants, says 31 seedlings and it counted the number of cells and it simply calculated germination percentage. Now this is can be quite useful in many seed companies because germination test is one of the um, purity tests they conduct. And if you have hundreds and hundreds of trays to measure, just take pictures and boom, in a second you get germination percentage. Of course, you can do this mathematically. I can ask my graduate student to count every single seedling and then calculate it, but it takes a lot of time. But you can do it like in one second, okay? This picture should be familiar to you. Now, I don't I don't do research on anthuriums. I don't grow anthuriums, but I thought probably do something that may be closer to what you do. So I, I got this picture from online. So this is not my picture. I just got a picture of anthurium plants. Now imagine you are an anthurium grower and you want to know how many flowers are there in a large area. Well, you can go and count them, but it takes a lot of time. You may damage while you're walking, but knowing the number of flowers is kind of you're knowing the yield of the uh, your, your crop, right? Because number of flowers kind of dictate num the, the value you get. And so I asked this question, OK, can the software count the number of anthurium flowers and and just use this image like I've showed you the, the curry leaf image just like that? I process this image and you, you can see here. This is the picture, right? Then the software separated the leaves from the flowers. And it counted every flower in this large area. See all those white things are it's a mask, but it came up with 48 flowers. In fact, I went back and counted them. They're pretty close to that. So this can be done like in one second. So farmers can walk by, stand in a large area, click a picture, Garbras, how many are there in this large area? Move on to next area. You can take a picture and get a count. So easy. Now, here are some tomato seedlings in pots and they're grown under optimum nitrogen and suboptimum nitrogen. And I took these pictures for human eye. We don't see much difference between these two, but the software is so sensitive that it's actually able to tell me that these plants under this optimum nitrogen are approximately 15% larger collectively, these four compared to these four. Again, keep in mind, human eye is not that sensitive, whereas the software is so sensitive that it can pick up small differences. That picking that small difference is the critical thing. When you can identify issues when the plants are small, then you can fix it quickly, then the damage is less. But then if you prolong and make the issue bigger, then you lose more. That's where this becomes very useful. And there is some data, actually, we did this, where we, we asked, we showed that same picture to our students and asked them to rate them visually and they didn't see much difference. But then the software is actually able to pick up statistical difference. And there was also in addition to tomato, there was also lettuce seedlings. And that's that's the reason why you're seeing two graphs. So it can detect growth issues very early and it's very sensitive. It can pick up small differences also. Um, here is another thing, poinsettias. Um, we apply a lot of plant growth regulators and probably some of you know what a plant growth regulator is. You spray them to reduce the height and make the plants look compact, right? But then when, do, when, you, when you apply plant growth regulators, you have to make sure that the plants are growing actively and you don't want to apply too much. 
and therefore what our growers normally do is they apply and then they start measuring the plant height and, and manually look at the height of the plants and decide how much they have to apply. But that's a very laborious, cumbersome process, going into every part, taking a, a, a ruler like a scale and measure it. But here is a software, you can take a picture and it can give you the height and width of the plants like that very quickly. So that's another advantage with this, another application, height and width. Leaf area, height and width, you combine all three, you kind of get uh, an estimate of plant weight, fresh weight or dry weight also can be measured. Um, here is another thing. I, this is again not my research. I don't research on Gerberos. So I brought this picture from uh, some other company. So what they had done is they took Gerberos and they were looking at uh, the vas life, the shelf life basically. So this is uh, starting zero, two days later, four days later and six days later. And so I asked my, uh, this, this, myself this question. Can we use images and come up with an index for shelf life? And so I took the pictures and I measured how much of this orange color is being reflected from these images using that software. More orange color means the flowers are probably fresh. And, and so here you go, the top row is the actual pictures and the bottom row is the segmented or the, the ones that the software used. It nicely identified the flowers from the background and then it gave me the gray value and I, like, I can explain what this gray value is. It's basically the reflectance of that particular color coming from these flowers. And then you can see how it is changing day one to day three to day five to day seven. So that's these, these flowers. You know, we know that this is not really looking good. And so that number is very low here. Uh, but then these two look kind of kind of similar that you start seeing a decline here. And so it, it, there is a potential here to actually image every hour, capture these pictures and kind of quantify that reflectance. And that that reflectance number can be used as an index for shelf life of flowers. So that is possible too. Um, what about nitrogen? So nitrogen stress index is another thing. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the science behind this before I show you how it is done. So here is chlorophyll, okay? So these are cells and these green circular things are chlorophyll pigment, the green pigment inside the leaves, we all know, right? And here is the formula for chlorophyll. And what do you see here? There is nitrogen in that chlorophyll molecule, right? There are four atoms of nitrogen in the chlorophyll molecule. So when nitrogen becomes deficient, then chlorophyll also becomes deficient. And that is the reason why nitrogen deficient plants appear to look chlorotic. In other words, they look yellow in color because they're losing chlorophyll, right? The older leaves start turning yellow in color. So nitrogen deficiency is related to chlorophyll. So if you, if you know that, then you look at what chlorophyll does. What does chlorophyll do? Chlorophyll absorbs light, right? And you, you see here, this is the light spectrum, chlorophyll absorption spectrum. What it is basically telling is chlorophyll absorbs light in the blue, which is this region, violet and blue, and in the red wave bands. So chlorophyll absorbs blue light and red light, blue light and red light, mostly. So let's say if nitrogen is deficient in a plant, probably then chlorophyll is also deficient in plant, then what it means is that that particular plant absorbs less of red light or blue light simply because there is less chlorophyll. You see the relationship between nitrogen to chlorophyll to light absorption. So if plant absorbs less red light, it reflects more red light. Absorption and reflectance are opposite. If nitrogen is deficient, then chlorophyll becomes deficient. When chlorophyll becomes deficient, plants absorb less red light, meaning they reflect more red light. Bingo, there you go. We can actually measure that reflectance from an image. And if I can capture the reflectance of red light, I can indirectly now measure nitrogen deficiency in plants. That is the logic here. Does it make sense, the logic? Are there any, are there any doubts about the logic? 
Yeah. Does it make Absolute, sense? Absolutely. Absolute. Perfect. Perfect listeners. All right. Thank you. Then let's let's let's. So that that's the that's the key here. Measuring that reflectance of red light. And so here is a uh, plant. This is a, uh, basically what I'm trying to measure here is something called nitrogen stress index. So here is a strawberry plant, and I take an image. What I can do is I take this color image, the green color strawberry plant. I can. There are three channels in this color image. There is a blue channel. There's a green channel. And then there is a red channel. When you combine these three, you get a color image. That's how the digital cameras work. There are filters for blue, green and red. And that's how the cameras know what color is coming into that sensor. They filter one color at a time and measure how much of that color came in. And then in the post processing, they do some software, combine these colors and come up with the actual plant color. What it means basically is the, the color image has three sub channels, blue, green and red. And I can take this plant. I can tell the software to separate the background from the plant. So here is a mask of the plant I've created. When I take this mask and superimpose on the plant, it gets rid of the background. Only you see the plant. It's masking off the background. It only keeps the green plant but I can do the same masking on these three channels. That means I've removed the background. Now I'm only focused on the plant area and I can measure the reflectance of blue, green and red colors. And these histograms show how the reflectance is changing. I can get an average reflect reflectance for red, average reflectance for green, average reflectance for blue, and I can create indices. I told you when nitrogen is deficient, then chlorophyll becomes deficient. That means plants are absorbing less red light. In other words, they're reflecting more red light. Therefore, this particular image, the red image, will be much brighter if it reflects more light. But I can quantify that number. And here is uh, uh, an example of something that we recently published where there is a control treatment and a nitrogen stress treatment. We came up with reflectance for red and we normalized it. We came up with a, something called an R value. That's a, a small index and that index actually decreases with nitrogen stress. So here we have an index that is measured from simple color image and that is telling you whether the plant has sufficient nitrogen or deficient amount of nitrogen. You now we, we just started with a simple color image now we have useful information about nitrogen concentration in the leaf tissue. That's a big piece that we are actually able to get that from a simple smartphone based image. You see the power. I don't have to send that leaf sample to a laboratory. Wait for a week. The laboratory charges me a certain amount of dollars and then I get some numbers about nitrogen concentration in plant. It takes time. You got to wait. But if I have that software on my phone, take a picture within a few seconds, I will know that R value. It will automatically calculate the R value. It will tell me how much nitrogen is there in the plant. I can give the software to our flower growers and they can give it to many, many growers who work with them. Everybody has a phone and these people are moving in the greenhouses. They're capturing images. They're measuring nitrogen concentration in plants everywhere. When you know that type of information, Based on that, you can make your fertilizer applications, right? You, if when the nitrogen levels goes below 4% or the R index value goes below a certain number, then you plan your fertilizer application. When you do that, you save your fertilizer. You make sure that you're applying when the plant needs nitrogen, not when you think you should apply, right? You're, you're fine tuning your nitrogen application based on plant demand, plant requirements, not based on some predetermined value, not based on a timer, not based on your own personal judgment. You are basing it on the science and you're basing it on the plant demand. And that's the right way to do. When you do that, you grow them with optimum level. They grow very well. The quality is good. You save money without wasting nitrogen fertilizer. So that's another powerful thing with this nitrogen stress index. But then here is important thing, right? Some of you probably are asking this question, how can we get this technology, right? And there was a question about MOU. 
So it is very important that we protect intellectual property. That's because when you protect intellectual property, you make the technology viable. Unfortunately, the world is not truthful. The world is not filled with people like you and me. There are always out there, there are hackers who are trying to get this technology. And even in the United States, there are people who can take the software, put it on a different name, and sell it on their own name to our growers at a higher price. If something like that happens, the amount of time I put on this research for last five years, the graduate students, the publications, the dollars that went into it, the hard work, the creativity, all that simply vanishes. So we have to protect intellectual property. So what we are doing at Purdue is we are creating a web server. Now, this web server can be accessed from anywhere on the planet. All the software, nitrogen, color, um, shelf life, plant height, weight, area, whatever it is, we are putting all the software on the web server. And if it is a university, we'll have some understanding and we can, we can, it's usually done in a different way. But what we are doing to our growers is we're asking them, we're, we're coming up with some apps. So they can take an app um, and purchase the app for a few dollars. And they can take, you turn on the app, they can take a picture. As soon as they take a picture, the app sends the image to the server. And they can select whatever they want, nitrogen content, plant weight, plant height, uh, shelf life, whatever they want. And all of that information is sent back from the server to their phones. So they just need a phone and they just need a small uh, license to buy that app. They take, they turn on the app and then the app will guide them how to take a picture. They take a picture, automatically the images go to the server, they get processed there and the farmers, the growers see the numbers. That's what, along with some recommendations. They may see an, a, an index value for nitrogen, and it'll also come up with your nitrogen is too high. Your nitrogen levels in the plants are too low. You may want to add fertilizer. So all that is being done right now, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna stop here because I know that I went way above my time. I'm okay to continue, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's too late for probably for some of you. However, this, this is this last section where it describes about technical aspects. In other words, how this is all done, what is the logic behind that. Now, some, some of that could be quite confusing and we don't need to go into that. Um, if, if there is an interest, I will delve into this. If there is time, we can go into this. If there is nothing, we can, we can just uh, go all the way to the end slide. Um, this is all the technical information, but we can, we, can, we can go to the end slide. What I want to really do is, um, I want to show you some information. So, so if, if you're interested, if you're a graduate student, you, you wanted to ask me some questions, but you could not ask me today, but you have some questions in your mind, um, go to this public place, Purdue Extension Education Store, and just type my name, and you will find one of these extension articles, and it talks about several things you can do with smartphones. Um, there are several publications that came out of our lab. Uh, some of my graduate students. So here is a couple from Computers and Electronics and Agriculture. Uh, there is one that came out uh, more recently in Horticulture. Again, it talks about smartphones. There is one um, that came from American Floral Endowment. So all this information is public and you can read and you can learn more about all of this. Okay. Uh, and uh, these are the people who are our sponsors. They provide me funding to do this research because money is not easily available, right? You have to compete. You have to come up with proposals that are highly competitive. So the, the three major funding organizations in the United States, American Floral Endowment, Fred Gloitner Foundation, and Horticulture Research Institute, the American Heart Foundation, they funded this research because they saw the importance of this. They saw the value of this. Very rare you will see that all three funding the same project, but they came together because they wanted to put more money into this. And so I've been very fortunate um, at least this is my team. This is the group that generates this information. My graduate students, visiting scholars, my undergraduate students who work in my lab and some of the professional staff who help me. Without their help, I couldn't have achieved anything at all. So they contribute a lot to this. They, some of them more, some of them less, some of them more technical, some of them more hardworking, some of them write papers, some of them manage things, doesn't matter. 
they all contribute equally. And you can notice I have a very diverse group. I have my students coming from all over the world, from Nepal, from United States, from Egypt, from China, from India, from Brazil, Pakistan, you name it. I have people from all over the world and I like it to keep it that way. I'm a big fan of diversity. And when we bring all cultures together, we learn good stuff from everybody. Then you become the best person, right? So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll just open up uh, if, there are, if there are any questions, if, if you want to discuss. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to, to spend. I, I have no restrictions on my time. I can spend as much as time you can spend. But if you have questions, I can I can discuss graduate students, faculty members, researchers. Um, I'm open to that. But then if you are busy and you have to leave, more than welcome. Um, you can hang up and you can always reach me by email in, in the future as well. OK, thank you. I think I think thank I said you. a lot. Thank I'll you. stop thank there and let I'll let you sp folks speak. OK. Uh, Good morning, thank sir. you, Dr. Krishna. Just uh, just one minute. Uh, before we go for asking questions, no, I'd like to interact with Dr. Krishna. Let's try to appreciate what he has taught us in the last more than one hour. You know, the way he has enriched our knowledge in these areas. Uh, just uh, let us try to understand, no, how smartphones have changed our lives. A simple thing, no. In our childhood, when we wanted to have a photograph, we used to visit a studio and then get a photograph clicked and then collect the printout maybe after a week or 15 days. And now you have a smartphone in your hand and you can click photographs as many of them throughout the day and in any position and wherever you are. That is how the smartphones have changed our lives. And then how they are going to change all these things, science and technology and agriculture, everything. This is what he was trying to emphasize, you know, like from visual diagnosis to lab-based biochemical analysis, to uh, moving on to smartphones. So how smartphones can be handy, but at the same time, how can they be accurate in diagnosing the things? For example, the nitrogen deficiency or the chlorophyll deficiency in leaves. One interesting thing was like he had showed us how to measure leaf area. Uh, Dr. Krishna, you <coughs> just imagine here in our university, students from agronomy, horticulture, most of them work with crops, the cereal crops, rice, wheat, pulses, uh, horticultural crops. Most of them try to measure leaf area and every time they struggle for it. Either we try to go for a leaf area meter, most of the times they are not working and then they go for destructive sampling, collecting leaves, measuring length and width and the way, the way how a smartphone can be used to measure leaf area. Yeah. So this is how the way things are changing, the way technology has changed our lives, we should use technology the way you have showed us to solve these problems. And a lot of data can be generated, whether it is seed germination, whether it is leaf area, whether it is nitrogen stress, all sort of data can be generated by using a smartphone, that particular, if you have that software. So this was wonderful, wonderful information. And the diagnosis, the detections are based upon certain principles, basic principles of science. The light absorption by chlorophyll molecules, reflectance by chlorophyll molecules. This is all pure science. So all the diagnosis is based upon these scientific principles, which is most accurate. That's true. Yeah. So uh, it has been a wonderful session, at least for me particularly. Become, I being a plant physiologist, I appreciate all the slides that you have shown. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. Thanks for staying with the presentation. I hope, uh, uh, you know, I, was, I wasn't I was sure, but I, I see that there's a lot of value here. And, and that's that's how a lot of people actually, even the United States uh, really see this. Um, it, it's, it's just that ease with which you can get this powerful information. You know, the phone is in your hand. You don't need to spend a dollar or, a, a, you know, any, any, any amount of money. All you need is access to software. And my intention is in the future, I want to just make it available to everybody. You know, that, that's, that's, what, that's what I'm driving going forward in the future. You know, if, if that type of power is in the hands of farmers, you know, just take a picture and, 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 and collect this type of information. Um, I, I, I think that's where agriculture should go. 
you know, India is one of the countries still, one of the few countries left on the planet still really, really rely on agriculture. We, we need to, we need to be doing this. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing your experiences and your, your, your thoughts about this talk. I really appreciate that. Welcome. Uh, you're most welcome, sir. Uh, over to Dipti and Dr. Ranesh Vastavji and Dr. Demri, sir. Yeah, sir. It is very, uh, uh, this has opened uh, our every uh, our uh, eyes and uh, I think we are entering in a new era, but uh, how long it takes to come India and uh, uh, to our uh, farmers. Uh, the talk is very much uh, informative and uh, uh, I think uh, the uh, participants number is uh, increasing uh, slowly and uh, slowly. So it is very informative and uh, I have no, we have no objection if you continue it for uh, further. <laughs> sure, I can, I, can, I can stay here and I can answer. I, I, I noticed some of the students wanted to ask some questions yes. too. So please feel free to ask me any question. I will be transparent. I will be honest in my replies. If I don't know something, I will tell you I don't know. If, if it's something that I cannot answer, I will tell you I cannot answer. But I will try to answer as many as possible questions. Yeah. Students can please ask. Before asking, please introduce yourself. Like you are yes, a please. first year. Yeah. yeah. Tell so me a little bit about uh, yourself. That way I know. Prior student ask question. I request Nimali sir, if uh, the presentation is over, you can stop sharing your screen because we want to uh, means have face to face interaction sort of thing. So thank for you. That, yes, sir. How about now? Yes, sir. Oh, it's okay. That's fine. Wonderful. Thanks for reminding me, Miss Dipti. I appreciate that. Students, please. What was the what was the thing that really attracted uh, uh, about Purdue University? I can ask this question to graduate students or undergraduate students. Do you see something really good at Purdue? Do you see something really bad? It doesn't matter, but uh, uh, do you want to share? How many of you really uh, are, are interested in uh, coming to the United States in the future? See, this is first comes, first serve basis. <laughs> Hello, yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Good morning, sir. So myself, Kevin Singh, BSC Agriculture, third year. So I want to answer first of all, thank you for such an interesting and interactive session you have with us. Sir, so my question is not about the uh, not about this topic, but about studying abroad. As many of the students like me who want to study abroad, but we did not get a pathway to go there, like uh, due to some financial condition, and uh, we have we didn't have uh, much knowledge about the scholarships provided there. So it would be great to privilege if you can explain some of this about us. Sure. Uh, when you when you mention study abroad, you are referring to a a master's or a PhD program, right? Yes, sir. So okay. Master's and PhD. Sure. Sure. So, so this is something that is very important for students to really understand. Um, number one, um, if I have to take a graduate student, a master student or a PhD student, I have to show to my university that I have funds available to make sure that the student will complete the program. Okay. We don't simply invite students to the United States. And unlike in India, in the United States, it is all about the faculty. We have to come up with funds for our graduate students. So I will tell you that numbers. For example, if you are coming for a master's program, I have to show to Purdue University that 
I have three years of funding. OK, three years means three times $40,000 per year. So that is $120,000 of mon money should be there with me and I should show that money to the Purdue University. Then they will allow me to pick up any student I want. That is only for a master's program. For a PhD program, I have to show funding for at least four years. Same number of dollars. So now it is $160,000. Now, $100,000 is one lakh dollars. So that is one lakh times 70 rupees. 70 lakh rupees is $100,000. Almost I have to show for a master student that I have one crore of rupees. Uh, and for a PhD student, even more than that. Now keep that number in mind. So what, what it means is that I get emails almost every day from all over the globe. Students send me their resumes. Students send me their TOEFL scores. They send me their GRE scores. But put yourself in my shoes, OK? And I'm asking this question. I am looking at a resume. How can I be sure that he or she is the person I should take and I should commit $150,000 on the student? That is the number one hurdle. OK, the number one hurdle for international students is we do not know you. As simple as that, right? We also know that and this is something I do not like, but I wanted to give a, a very honest opinion to you. If you are trying to reach out to many faculty, please do so. However, don't write that common email to everybody. You know, it, it is when I read the email from students from other countries, within a second I can see if that email is directly writing intended for me, or is it something like a general email and just the two names are changed? That tells me that the student is just trying to get somehow funding and come to the United States. Whatever they're claiming that they're interested in my program is not true. So please do not write a general email and send it to every faculty the same content. At least try to be personal. Try to tell that I have went to your website, I looked at your website, uh, I like this, this is the area where I think my research interests fit with what you are doing in your lab. And when you try to build that personal communication, at least a personal touch, then the faculty may have at least some interest to read through your email. But if I see the email that tells me that by the end of the first line, that is just a, a common email that the student has sent to maybe 100 faculty in the United States, I may not even read through it. Forget about even opening their uh, TOEFL or GRE scores. So keep that in mind. Again, the second thing is, how do I know you? How do I figure out that you are the right candidate whom I can trust and put together that big funding, right? So this money is something that I'm getting from United States Department of Agriculture or maybe from federal funding, right? then funding monies are going down. They are becoming limited. So very, very competitive. So on one side, that is very competitive. And the other side, how do I know the student? And so, so far, most of the students who work with me, they've either worked with me before and then became graduate students, or they came here as a visiting scientist and worked with my lab for a an year and then decided to become a graduate student. Because they worked with me for a an year, I know them. Now, when they go back, for example, uh, there was a student who, who came from China and she spent a year in my lab during her last year of her master's program. Some of the universities in China, she came from China Agriculture University and their university funds a scholarship program where students can go for one year to the United States, work in the United States with the faculty or a researcher of their interest. But China Agriculture University funds that one year period. So they stay in our labs for one year. We interact with each other. We know them for one year. 
if they are really good, they go back to China, they com she completed a program, and she emailed me and said that I want to do a PhD, but I want to come to the United States. Then I did not hesitate. I found some money and I brought her here. You see that familiarity, that is the key thing. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy to get familiarized yourself with, with faculty, right? So how do you get familiarized? This is one of the opportunities. I, I've been asking students several times during this meeting, during this presentation, do you have questions for me? Do you want to ask me anything? You know the reason why I wanted to ask you? Because I want to know about you. This is the way, this is the channel for you to talk to me. As soon as I log off, I leave, this is over. So whenever an opportunity comes to you, use it. Otherwise, no, it's not going to happen. And this is the hard truth. If the faculty knows you, at least by some means. For example, the other method is, I know somebody, let's say I know Dr. Srivastava, and we've been working, I've been doing research with them. Let's say that happens in the future. And I, I, I interact with Panthanagar. I come to Panthanagar, I meet students. That's how I know the students. And when they contact me in the future, I will be able to know them by their names. I'll be able to relate them. And the references that your faculty professors provide are also going to be very valuable. So that's another way. So attend conferences. Um, sometimes uh, just email faculty and ask them something about an interesting area that the faculty is doing research. Not about, not about coming to the United States as a graduate student. Try contacting faculty even a year before you want to come. You know, contact them, ask them, tell them you're, you're an undergrad student, you're a graduate student, I'm working in this area, I have some questions about this area, I have questions about this research, can you help me, can you guide me? Maybe most of them may not get back to you, but some of them will get back to you, and that is how you establish a relationship. So that is the critical thing, just don't send an email asking them that I'm interested in your program, are you taking a graduate student? Very unlikely they will respond to you, okay? So I, I just I just wanted to give you a very transparent opinion. Um, some of you may not like it, but that's the reality. And I hope that makes sense. OK. Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions? Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Hi. Sir, I am uh, Shiba Belwal. So it, it is so fortunate uh, to get to get another chance to communicate with you through this medium. Uh, so um, we prior to this talk through serve interaction, and uh, it is really fortunate that I've got this chance again. Sir, uh, I really found the uh, information that you delivered to us about remote sensing really very interesting because for research students like us, such uh, technologies really come in handy because we have to measure various parameters that are related to crop physiology. As yes. so, uh, I have a question that uh, my research work currently uh, relates to the hybridization program in Gerberas. So, sir, in that uh, particular field, I have to know, like, uh, because it is done, uh, Gerberas are basically propagated through tissue culture commercially, but for hybridization, we require a uh, virus seeds. So, is there any particular technology through remote sensing that we can know that uh, this particular plant is producing virus seeds? Because otherwise, it gets really cumbersome because we have to do it in a large scale and one by one through hand picking, we have to know that if the seed is viable or not. Sure. Uh, so, sir, yeah, do you have any information regarding that? Okay. okay. So, Ms. Belwell, uh, 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 nice talking to you again. Uh, unfortunate that uh, your application didn't go through, but I hope that in the future we'll continue to work and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work with Purdue India collaboration. And thank you for asking that question. Um, so, basically, what you're asking, or basically what I understood, was you're looking for a, a phenotypic marker, right? Uh, to quickly identify. A, a plant that's uh, that you're interested in versus the one that you're not interested in. Am I right? Is that what you're asking? So sorry, can you please uh, uh, please interpret again? You, your voice is breaking up. Are my? Hello? Uh, do you hear me clearly? 
So I can hear you clearly. Uh, I didn't catch the last phrase you mentioned. I was I, I wanted to make sure that I understood your question. You want yes, to sir. know you wanted to develop a phenotypic marker, right? Meaning something that is you can capture by taking a picture. You can look at that marker and say that this is the plant I want versus the other plant. Is that what you're trying to get to? Sir, I want to know if the particular plant that I've hybridized, if it is producing viable seeds. Ah, I see, I see. And why uh, 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 you want to know uh, in what is the species, Garbaras? Sir, yes, it is Gerbera species, but sir, I am I'm going to do a progeny test on Gerberas that can only be done through seed produced Gerberas. So micro propagation is not an alternative in that uh, aspect. So, sir, I want to know if the plant that I'm testing, if I'm that the parent that I'm choosing for seed production, is it producing viable seed for the hybridization program that I'm going to carry out through the seeds? OK, all right. So so um, I'm probably going to answer in a very general way uh, simply because I don't have the, the data in front of me, but hopefully that will help you go to the next level. OK, at least to the next step. So again, if you look at the my presentation, there are two things I've mentioned. The first thing is anything that is seen on the plant, anything that the camera can capture in terms of color, change in color. If the seed, seeds on the Gerbera plants is associated with some change in color, you can pick that one. OK, so that is a two dimensional color image and, and that is one way to differentiate one versus other using the image, but it has to be something different. It may not be something we can see, but maybe there is something different. OK, but that that is something to keep in mind. For example, you can start asking this question. Is there any particular color? on the flower when you take an image of the plant is there any particular color that is changing when there are more seeds versus less seeds okay so that is something you can ask and you can quantify that and then when you see a correlation with this number of seeds and that particular parameter then you have established a phenotypic marker so that's one thing i mentioned it's a color image the second thing is a little bit deeper you know an example would be that nitrogen Right, it is happening inside the cells. Something is being absorbed or reflected, right? And so we can actually use a little bit more expensive filters, okay, and try to pick up only reflectance from a particular wavelength. And that is something that needs to be tested. If there are, for example, more seeds in a plant, are they particularly absorbing a wavelength versus the other wavelength? Uh, that is much more like looking at the entire the band of uh, you know between 400 to 700 nanometers or even beyond 700 nanometers of light and picking at different wavelengths and see if a particular wavelength is changing between the two types of seeds seed versus an unseeded variety so that's another way to solve this problem now i don't i, I don't i uh, hopefully you you, you caught what I'm trying to say here. I don't have an answer for your question, direct answer, simply because I don't have data. I have not tested Gerbera's seed versus unseeded thing, but there is a path to that. What it means is that you have to create a plant with different amounts of seed on it, try to image that plant, and then start looking at several things, reflectance, color changes, all those things. And if you're lucky, you'll find a marker that is specifically changing with the seed number. And once you identify that, then that's something that you can tell the software to always pick up in order to tell you whether there is a seed or there is no seed in it. OK, what it means is basically you have to develop that algorithm yourself. Without doing that, we, don't, we do not know the answer for that, but it is possible. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yes, thank you, sir. Probably because uh, the viable seeds contain starts, probably we can develop a marker that uh, based on the starch reflectance of any particular wavelength that we can obtain. So probably in future this might be worked upon. <laughs> so mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, if you uh, th there are people who do research using 
more expensive hyperspectral cameras and there are cameras that pick up reflectance all the way to 1500-1600 nanometer wavelengths and there are certain particular compounds in seeds that absorb these wavelengths. Um, now we are way beyond the, the, the standard visible light. We are looking at 1500 nanometers, 1600 nanometers, or even 2000 nanometers. Certain compounds inside seed can absorb these particular wavelengths. And it's all about identifying what that is. And once you identify the marker, then it becomes easy. What it means is that you have to do an extensive screening in the initial phase to figure out if there is anything changing in terms of reflectance between a plant with seed or without seed. And once that information is identified, it can be simply ex exploited in many other cases. Thank you, sir, for addressing my issue. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, myself Jyoti, I'm a student of PhD. Uh, so thank you for uh, throwing insight on such an informative technology, first of all. And sir, my question is that uh, how to get access to uh, these kind of softwares? It, it, are they available? Like yeah, um, that is something I'm also interested. So. Uh, if if there is an interest, you know, for example, let's say in the horticulture department uh, in your university, if there are many faculty uh, who feel that there is a value to this type of technology, we can work uh, some sort of a memorandum of understanding between Purdue University and GB Panth uh, Agriculture University, wherein uh, the software can be easily transferred uh, or you know, uh, for research purposes. Basically, if that type of MOU happens, in other words, some, some non-disclosure agreements, basically what it means is that we share research with each other, uh, we make sure that the research is still protected, but we, uh, we, we, are, we are okay with discussing between the two universities among faculty or among students and faculty. That type of agreement, if that is once that is reached between Purdue University and Pantanagar University, then it is very easy to share this type of information and research can use that. The other method model is a, a collective funding. Uh, there could be some methods where, you know, we can come up with a, a, a funding, a grant proposal that benefits both universities. Um, there are always some grants that are global and we can probably come up as a, as a team, several faculty coming together and we approach uh, students and faculty, we approach this granting agency and develop some funds. And once we have that type of resources, then we can easily freely distribute that. However, a, a, at a minimum, at a minimum, an understanding has to be established between two universities before the intellectual property that's been developed at Purdue can be transferred to you. It has been done. It is possible. Uh, it's only some form of paperwork. We have an organization called Sponsored Program Services within Purdue who deal with this. And basically, I tell them what I'm looking for. I give them the introduction and they will work on behalf of Purdue with your university, with the responsible people from Dean's office in your university and create that paperwork. And once that paperwork is there and we bound to the regulations within that paperwork, afterwards we can freely share knowledge, software, science. We can conduct collaborative research. We can publish collectively. All that is possible. Yes, sir. yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for asking that question. Sir, I think now it's the time for wrapping up the session. Thank you. Already, yep. uh, uh, we have engaged so much of time of yours and it's already been, I think it's going to be midnight uh, there at your place. So with, uh, without uh, means <laughs> without delaying your sleep more, I feel uh, because uh, students, uh, the way you presented the thing, the way you presented the concept, because I myself was knowing that MATLAB has such a wide utility. 
here at Pantanga University, people of engineering use that. To your this voice laptop, but I was not interrupted. Known, like, exactly. Yes, sir. Uh, God, you, you are back. Your voice was interrupted in between. Okay, please, please sir. go ahead. Uh, so, so I was not known exactly this much diverse the software is and the way you put up the presentation that was really very, very nice. I, I uh, feel uh, that the those students who are uh, getting benefited from you as a professor, they might be very lucky students to have you as their teacher. So now uh, moving towards the conclusion of this particular session, which is very insightful and indeed the way you answered the questions of young students indeed benefited i hope that they have been they might, might have benefited from this thing so now i request uh, dr dc timri sir who is professor and head of the department of horticulture at panma university for uh, putting up the for concluding the session and also putting up a formal vote of thanks so that we can end the session and meanwhile uh, dimri sir prepares himself i request all the participants to put their videos on so that we can have a group moment all together. So inviting Dimri sir for vote of thanks and a conclusion and all the participants for having a group selfie. So Dimri sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dipti. So sir, it is a, the talk is a very informative and uh, due to limitation of the time, uh, we, our faculty and our student uh, at uh, have left many things so we will we will try again in some time to link you sir for that we will make a request so finally the time is going on so uh, uh, for the vote of uh, thanks uh, it is uh, my privilege to deliver vote of thanks uh, at the end of this uh, online talk on the smartphone waste sensors for greenhouse production being organized by Department of Horticulture and NAHIP National Agriculture Higher Education Project, Pantanagar. So with a great sense of gratitude, I acknowledge Dr. S.K. Kashyapji, who is our Dean, College of Agriculture and PI of this IDP, NAHIP Pantanagar, for his continuous support and the able guidance. Today, uh, we are fortunate to have and listen Dr. Krishna Nimali, Assistant Professor, Controlled Environment Agriculture, Purdue University, USA, uh, in this uh, virtual program. I thank uh, Dr. Krishna Nimali for accepting our request, invitation, joining us, and delivering such an informative talk on the smartphone-based sensors for greenhouse production. Really, sir, you have talked a lot about the horticulture and landscape architecture, uh, about the uh, this remote sensing, drone technology, and uh, how the smart uh, this is smartphone uh, technology works in agriculture. Thanks, sir. Many many thanks to you. Uh, thanks, sir. Also due to uh, Dr. S K Guru, who is a uh, plant physiologist, uh, physiologist and. Uh, uh, I have seen that he was taking much interest in your this uh, talk and uh, in time to come, he will collaborate to, with the, you also to, uh, to uh, import this uh, technology here also in our university and in our country. Uh, we are also thankful to Dr. Ranjan Srivastava, Professor Horticulture for contacting you, sir, and arranging the talk and his uh, uh, nice uh, coordination which makes uh, this uh, webinar a great success. Thanks to all the faculty members, Department of Horticulture for their uh, uh, cooperation and active participation in this uh, webinar. Uh, you have seen that a large number of students have shown their interest uh, in this program. Our thanks to, uh, to all of them for joining with us. And uh, lastly, at the end, we appreciate the role of uh, technical team of NAHIP Pantanagar and uh, their electronic and print media for wider publicity of uh, this uh, talk among the social networking groups. So with this, I thanks one and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.
well uh, thank you sir so if any of the students wants to express words of gratitude to uh, nemali sir because i hope that apart from being a dedicated horticulturist nemali sir is more of a enthusiastic teacher as well so looking forward for some feedback from the student as a final vote of thanks and uh, ending the session with that so if any of the students wants to express and give any kind of feedback to what nemali sir said it can be anything even a word of thank you will also work so any of the students please jyoti jyoti bajale please please say something yeah dr ajay yes, please sir, sir i would like to thank the students i would like to thank you sir for uh, throwing such an uh, sir throwing your insight on such an innovative technology this is a very new topic to us and uh, thank you for giving uh, this enlightenment sir thank you so much you welcome most welcome thank you very much i think everybody wants to thank dr nimali so thanks from all of us for accepting and then at a very late hours of yours you are It still means very energetic and then uh, trying to reply to each of the queries. I think students will get back to you. Even we faculty would like to get back to you uh, yes. to have coordination for other work in future. Absolutely, most welcome. Anytime uh, you have my email, best way.